So, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming along. Uh, we've got Justin Hunt here to talk to us about writing Moodle plugins. I don't know about you, but when I tell newbies to Moodle that there's over 300 something plugins yeah. to Moodle, they always look a little <laughs> bit overwhelmed. Um, but I know, I know personally when we're looking at plugins for clients, if we see Justin's name on top of the list, we go, yeah, that's okay. So it'll be interesting to hear what he has to tell us. So thank you, Justin. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, there's um, yeah, lots of plugins. So yeah, so hello everybody, and thanks for coming along today. Uh, this is actually my third, I think, iMoot, or fourth even. Um, and actually, this time I had a chance to to look at some some other presentations, and there were some, there were some really good ones. You know, ones I you know kind of I suppose I chose ones this this time that were not my field. You know, so so there was actually a lot for me to learn. So that was really good. So I've been having a good iMoot. And I presented first on Thursday. So this is the second version of that presentation and hopefully it's a better one. I, I went away and changed a few things around, um, fixed a few things up. So hopefully it's uh, a little bit better than the one on Thursday. So that'll be good. And we're going to be talking about Moodle plugins and writing them. So I don't know what the kind of level of people is in terms of development ability. So it would be great if you could just chat in the text area there um, if you've done any PHP developing, or if you are a developer, or if you have not done any PHP developing, or uh, other kinds of developing, could you just type that into the chat area for me? Okay, none, two nuns. Okay. Okay, so Scott, Scott, so I think I'm sure I've seen Scott's name around on a few things. So um, anything Moodle? Any, oh, you must have any Moodle themes and plugins. So you must, must have done some stuff. Good. Yes, I've seen your name places. Randy's done some um, development too. I'm pretty sure I've seen Randy's name around a few times. Okay. All right. Well, so uh, okay, so that's good. So I guess we're at slight, slightly different levels, but um, we'll kind of just try to bridge that as we go. Uh, if there's anything you want me to go slow on or, or uh, isn't clear, let me know, or if, we, if there's anything that's just dead easy, um, I'll just skip over that. Okay, okay, so, okay, so Scott, Scott and Neil are, are all old timers, that's good. And they've got beers in their hands, it's, that's good. Okay, so these are some of my plugins. Uh, I started writing plugins pretty much as soon as I got into Moodle because I was teaching at the time, and I'm not teaching now. But at the time I was teaching and I needed to have an audio recording thing. So, uh, so I wrote an audio recording widget, which eventually became Poodle. Um, it just kind of organically grew into Poodle, which is a suite of kind of audio and video recording and a few other things. Um, housed up into different 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 kinds of plugins, um, and then I started doing other other plugins and just kind of got, got into it really. Uh, so now I'm pretty much full time writing code for Moodle, um, not not for Moodle HQ. I just do contract work for different places. Um, so I've got a lot of plugins that are on the plugin database, but a lot that are also not on the plugins database. Some some I'd like to put on, I just haven't had time, and some that um, are kind of I guess. People have paid for them and they don't really want them released. So, so that's the situation. Some of the newer ones that you might have recognized, you might have heard about, in addition to Poodle, are Generico and Video Easy. And what else have we got there? The Family Module. Uh, that's not, not on the plugins database yet, but I, I'll do that any day soon. Uh, and the YouTube Anywhere. Um, okay, so those are some of the, uh, some of the recent ones. The generica filter. Yeah, the generica filter, it's probably, I still think, flying under the radar a little bit. It's really useful. I, I use it a lot myself, which is, you know, it's, it's saved me a lot of work because I don't have to write a, a plugin for every, every little thing that I need to, you know, achieve. I can just kind of go into the generica filter and make a template. So if you haven't, if you haven't tried the generica filter, that's a, a good shortcut if you don't want, actually want to write a whole plugin, but you just need a little bit of functionality. Okay. Uh, Moving on. So Moodle is a framework for writing plugins or code. It's actually very high level. There's a lot of functionality in the framework. And if you get involved and if you get, well, if you've done any development before, you'll know that these are things that you often need. And if you don't have to write them yourself, if, they, if there are kind of these already APIs 
and hooks for you to hook into. You don't have to do them yourself. It's really, really handy and it makes things very fast. So some of the things that Moodle has are user management. So, you know, users can sign themselves up or they can be, you can create users, you can import them. It's got backup and restore. It's got uh, navigation, you know, breadcrumbs and menus. Uh, it's got logging. It's got a, a forms module, so you'd have to write HTML forms from, from scratch. It's got background tasks. So, for example, if you wanted to convert a video that somebody had uploaded, you could set that as a background task uh, and you wouldn't have to make the user wait for that to happen. It's got database APIs, of course, and those are, um, those allow you to use the database APIs so that uh, your plugin will, you know, will, will be usable on Oracle or SQL Server or MySQL. It's database independent. Internationalization, it's got uh, so different, you know, different language strings. Capabilities, is very, very uh, highly grained permission system. And file system APIs for getting um, files in and out of the server. Um, so the flip side of, of having a really powerful flame framework like that is that it's also very uh, complicated and it can be kind of overwhelming, especially in the beginning, because it seems like you have to know everything in order to start, which isn't actually true. Um, but when you're looking through the code, you'll see all these things that you don't, that you don't really understand, even as a PHP developer, if you're new to Moodle, it can be quite overwhelming. And it can make you a bit scared of developing in case you do something wrong. Um, especially because it's open source and other people will see your code. Um, but you really shouldn't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be worried about that, I don't think, because I, I made all sorts of mistakes along the way and I'll talk about those soon. Um, so I think just in time learning is really, you know, the, the key word here. So key three words, four words. So there's no need to actually learn everything before you begin. I think really you should just get, get stuck into it. And then as you need something, for example, as you need backup and restore, then go and figure out how it works. Or as you need a background task, go and figure out how to get that to work. That's my advice to, to new people. Um, so how, what's your development environment going to look like? What are you going to need on your computer? Well, there's two kind of broad streams here. There, there are those that use an IDE and those that use a programmer's text editor. Uh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm the text editor um, type. I prefer to use Notepad++ on Windows or Text Wrangler on Mac. And I swap between machines a lot. So I, I have a number of different places that I work. You know, I take my notebook somewhere and I work there. I work upstairs on my Mac or I go somewhere else and I work on another machine. So um, for me, that works very well. But it does mean I don't have some of the, the features of an IDE like debugging and being able to just, you know, step through the code and see uh, so I think have all of the Moodle source code all loaded up, ready for me to view. Which are the benefits of an IDE? And the IDEs that people mainly use are Eclipse, NetBeans, and PHP Storm. Andy and Scott, what do you use IDEs? What do you actually use, you guys? Uh, Andy, it's uh, Scott and Neil. I suppose Scott and Neil. Calling you out there, sorry. I shouldn't just call you out. Okay, so Scott uses PHP Storm. Okay, actually, I haven't tried that, but I have thought that maybe I should just do that because sometimes uh, I get a bit frustrated with NetBeans. Right, yeah, I've used Android, uh, NetBeans, and Eclipse, and I guess I prefer NetBeans. Six of one, half dozen of the other, really. Anyway, as a, as a, as a newbie, my, my advice is to use a program as text editor, but other people will give you the exact opposite information, so um, take your choice, really. <laughs> Don't fight the chat area. Okay, um, so what, what, what are some Moodle settings that are going to help you as a developer? Um, well, the two main ones are in the debugging area, um, site administration, development, uh, debugging. Uh, you've got debug messages and display debug mes messages. Just, just to speed things up, when, when er errors are actually your friend as a developer, so you really want to see those messages that come through. So if you set the debug messaging level to developer, so you'll get extra Moodle de debug messages for developers, that will give you like the line number and the file in which the error occurred, which is a good thing. So you can go straight to it and fix it up. Uh, and display debug, debug messages sends that to the browser, so you can actually see see the error you know, on the page that the error occurred. Um, that can break some things, um, but at, at that level of things, you probably would just, would just you know, turn off debugging and then um, do it that way. Uh, the other way is the other thing is purging all your caches. So Moodle has a lot of caching going on, and it caches JavaScript, it caches language strings, 
Um, and as you're developing, that can be a bit of a, a bit of a pain because the, the changes that you've made are not always reflected. So you need to purge your cache regularly. You can actually turn the cache off uh, in various places. Um, I haven't included those here. The main place to do that is in the theme settings. You can set develop a designer mode. Does it set, it, set designer mode on, and that will turn the uh, the caching for um, style sheets in JavaScript off. Okay, but you'll still need to purge caches if you update your language strings. So how to start? Well, I mentioned before just how complicated Moodle is and how much there is going on. So when you look at um, an existing template, existing existing mod, you'll see there's a lot of files in there. I might just skip through so I can show you some of those files. Can I do that? So I'm just going to jump ahead here a little bit. Shouldn't really do this. I've jumped way, I've jumped way too far ahead. There we go. So you can see these are the, the files in the top top uh, the top level of a plugin folder. Uh, and then you've all these other five folders in there as well, and they contain files as well. So there's a lot of files in there. And really, you don't want to go and create things from scratch or do it by hand. It's just going to take you way too long. Uh, you need a lot more knowledge than you're probably going to have, and you're going to make mistakes. So nobody ever kind of starts their plugin by just, you know, making a new index index.php and, and coding. No one ever does that. They always um, do what I'm about to talk about, which is get an existing plugin or template and modify it. So you, you'll copy an existing mod or you'll use a template. Uh, and either uh, in either case, the process is you download that template or similar mod, you rename it, which means not just the folder, but all the uh, the content as well. So for example, if the plugin that you downloaded was mod quiz, that would not be a good example, but mod quiz, you would change all instances of the word quiz to the name of your template the name of your plugin. Then you would install it, fix up any issues because there's bound to be some issues, uh, and then modify it according to your purpose. Some of the templates that are out there for you to use, uh, for the activity module, there's uh, these two options. One of those is mine, and that's the one we're going to use today and I'm going to talk about. That's got probably more features and it's more up to date than the Moodle HQ one. And I, I just maintain it for myself, really, uh, which is why I don't kind of like you know, update Moodle HQ's one. I just kind of keep my own one going. Um, but it's got a lot of hooks and bells and things that you'll see shortly. There's a question type by Jamie Pratt, who's at the Open University. Then uh, there's a block block by Daniel Nice. Um, there's an Atto plugin template, which is also something I've written. Uh, and if you start with a template, uh, there's not a whole lot of code for you to change, and there's not a lot of you know functionality that's really specific to something else. Um, so it's actually a good place to start. A really easy plugin to begin with is probably an, an Atto plugin because it's just a, a little icon that appears on the editor and does something very small, like turns the font, font to bold or um, inserts a picture into the into the text area. So that's a good place to start if you really want to you know, start from scratch. Or other people have recommended a block. Um, today we're going to use this uh, plugin here for the activity module, though. Um, so let's talk about my new module template. Um, some of the things that it has in there, it has scheduled tasks and ad hoc tasks. So uh, make, those are kind of new features. They came in Moodle 2.7. I use them quite a bit. I find them very, very useful for just setting, setting things to run in the background or when somebody, for example, um, wants to convert a video, I can, I can they, they record a video and then in Poodle, I want to then convert that video to MP4. I'll, I'll set an ad hoc task and just say, you know, here's your ad hoc, ta ad hoc task and return to the browser. And then a few minutes later, Moodle will actually go through and do that conversion in the background. Uh, the schedule task is a little bit different. That is, uh, that's more of, more, more of the idea of a cron task. It runs every five minutes or every hour, for example, to, to see it's any messages to send out on the forum and then it sends out the messages, something like that. Anyway, the, uh, the new module template has a schedule task and an ad hoc task. Uh, uses a renderer, which the, the the bog standard template doesn't do, so that keeps all your view your view logic separate from your other logic. It's got logging. It's got tabs, so you can have an admin can see uh, one tab, and the the regular users uh, can see different tabs or not as many tabs as the admin. It's got backup and restore. It's got instance settings and admin settings. 
Um, it's got capabilities, so managers can see one thing, perhaps the tabs here that we talked about, uh, and it's got reporting. It's got some reporting classes in there and some reporting uh, kind, of a, like a, kind of a framework, really, so you can build your reports pretty fast. I find every time I make uh, an activity module, I need to include reports, so it seemed a good idea to just, you know, add some reporting, kind of add a framework in there of, of, of a sort. Okay, I hope I'm not going too quick. Or too slow. So dumb mistakes I have made. Okay, so yeah, I've been doing this for you know, six years or so. Or it feels like longer. And in the beginning, especially, I came from a Java background, a Visual Basic background, because I made financial apps here in Japan for a financial services software company and telephony apps in, in uh, Java before I before I returned to teaching. And when I came into to Moodle, I really hadn't studied PHP or learned PHP. And I didn't know, didn't know a whole lot about Moodle. I just knew what I needed to make for myself. So some of the mistakes that I made, which I don't want you to make, I'm going to go through them just quickly, is I messed up my component name a few times. So the Moodle, uh, Moodle has, a, has a special kind of component name called a Frankenstein name, which I'll explain a bit more later. But that's the key to everything, really. And if you mess that up, uh, you really put yourself in a bit of a pickle because you can't even upgrade your way out of the situation. So... Make sure you get your you choose a good component name and make sure you get it right. Um, I didn't use Git when I first started. I used Mercurial, and in the Moodle world, everybody uses Git, and that's you know actually Git's actually really really good. There's no it's nothing bad to say about it. Since I've gone to Git, I've really um, it's really been really efficient and it's made my processes so much better. So from the beginning, if you have a choice or you or you don't know how to use Git, you should really go out and learn Git. Uh, I didn't follow some of the rules. There's various rules about how to load JavaScript or how to name your functions, or how to name uh, the JavaScript objects. I didn't follow a lot of those rules, and it was, it was mainly because I didn't know what they were. But uh, it pays before you begin to actually go through and read the developer documentation through once at least, just to get an idea of um, what's going on. And also pay attention to what other people are doing with their plugins. Go and look, read through their code because you'll get some good ideas and tips and you'll kind of you'll notice patterns of people doing certain things and you should probably just fall in and do the same way because the rules are really there to uh, to help you just as an example this is uh, a lady contacted me about two years ago and she said you know we're having all sorts of problems with our plugin can you help us and i was like okay and they were using poodle and you know, half of it just wasn't working it was working in one particular mode but it wasn't working in another particular mode and those uh, those people that actually hacked hacked really hacked Moodle they didn't they wanted everything to appear as a pop-up or in a kind of a window without without a footer and without a header and without blocks and they just lopped off the footer now if you knew a little bit about Moodle you'd know that the uh, the JavaScript all, all loads up in the footer and so if you, if, you actually, if you actually don't output the footer, then none of your JavaScript is going to run. And so much is dependent on JavaScript these days uh, that this, this was their, their problem. You know, they just had decided they didn't want the footer, so they didn't display it. Um, so that's a good example of you know being a tourist in Moodle, not really understanding how it all works. Um, so do go through and read the documentations and try to follow the rules because it will be in your best interests. I didn't use capabilities initially. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Neil, <laughs> did you make that mistake too? <laughs> I made a whole lot of mistakes. So, yeah, didn't use capabilities. Yeah, um, uh, cap Moodle's got a really good capability system. It's quite complicated. You'll see, you know, lots of references to the context and things like this. Um, try to get up to speed with that because in the institutions, especially, you know, in universities and, and places with a lot, of, a lot of teachers, they actually really rely on capabilities. And the more hooks you give those people, the happier they'll be. So that's a good thing to do. Um, didn't ask on forums. You know, my program is pride. I tried to figure things out. That's really dumb. Just um, uh, there's lots of really helpful people on the Moodle forums, and you should just go and ask questions, even if they seem silly to you, or even if you don't really know how you should ask, um, because you'll get good answers. Um, I edited files outside my plugin folder, which is, you know, it's okay you know, to do that because I had things that I wanted to share between different modules. But... Uh, that makes it impossible for you to get your plugin into the Moodle plugins database because everything's got to be compartmentalized in its own little plugin folder. So that was, you know, something I really did in the early days that um, I wouldn't do again. Didn't read the documentation, didn't use a renderer. I made my own forms. Moodle's got wonderful you know, HTML forms that you can just hook into, so there's no need to make your own forms. Okay, I'm straying into the 
getting stuck in the weeds here, so let's move a bit more quickly. For new programmers, there's a few people here who are new uh, to programming. So this is just, just a couple of tips, things that I, I, I suggest people do. Keep a piece of paper and pen handy and take a lot of notes. As I'm coding, I just take notes about, about you know, for example, the line number that I'm on before I scroll up to look at the next place that, that, refer, that relates to it so I can come back quickly. Um, just something I realize, oh, I've got to, I've got to change that language string. I, I added a new language string. I better not, better not forget to change that. I just make a little note on my memo pad. Uh, and if I find that much more efficient than, you know, loading up uh, the new page and realizing that I've forgotten to add the language string. I just, you know, uh, try not to keep everything in my head. I keep a Google Doc per project because often I think I'm going to return to something in an hour or two hours or the next day. It might be a week or two weeks before I get back to it and I've forgotten what I was doing and where I was. So it's really a good idea to keep a Google Doc per project, like a project diary, just keep notes of what you're doing. Uh, when you get stuck, post on a forum, then do something else. Yeah, sometimes you you know you find yourself you know bat battling away till two in the morning, um, just getting kind of more and more tired and not not being able to see the forest for the trees. Um, it's really a good idea just to post on a forum and then just do something completely different and then come back to that problem later on. Um, it's just more efficient, saves time, and you, you may find either you come up with the answer or your mind's doing something else or somebody else does it for you. Keep cheat sheets handy. I, I can never remember which is the needle and which is a haystack, you know, for things like STI replace. So um, for PHP and JavaScript, try cheatography.com. They've got lots of good cheat sheets and read other people's code. There's lots of really good code out there. Um, read through that. If you if you want to implement something and you think, well, where, where have I seen that in Moodle before? Go and have a look at that module and then see how that person implemented it. Um, don't be shy about emailing that person and asking them how they did that. They will probably answer you. Uh, and develop a documentation. Make sure you read it. And there's the links. Ask questions here in the forum. Okay, uh, and in order to modify, we must first understand. Yes, we must. So let's have a quick look at the contents of a plugin, and let's see um, what they all are. Okay, um, are we all here? Anybody, anybody want to pause the events here and ask a question, or does anybody want to um, tell me to talk slower or faster or cover something I haven't covered? Now would be a good time to do that. Okay. Okay. Okay, good. Oh, that's fine. Um, okay, so these are the uh, the contents of the database activity plugin, which is actually a core plugin. Um, and this is, this is the styles.css. Can you see that? Styles is the CSS files for your your mod. Your activity module. So if you put your CSS styles in here, Moodle will just load those for you and you don't have to do anything. You don't have to you know, add anything anywhere. It will just load them for you. So that's a good thing to do. And it will cache them too. So um, put all your styles in here. And lo uh, yeah, this is, uh, I talked about the component name earlier and how the component name is key to everything. If you prefix your styles uh, with your component name, then you can be sure that you won't clash with something. So if your component is called mod underscore data, then you might, you know, have as a, as a class for one of your tables, you might have mod underscore data underscore table. And that way, uh, you know that your mod is not going to clash with some of the, somebody else's mod in terms of the CSS styles. And that goes for JavaScript and functions uh, in, um, in PHP files that aren't, 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 as, aren't members of a class. Okay, um, we've got edit.php. So this is, this houses the uh, the form that people use to create an instance of your plugin. So when they when they when they go when they open up and they say I'm going to add a new instance of the database activity, um, they'll see the edit.php file with the form inside it. And the form itself is here, mod form. Okay. So let's fold those two here. Uh, Index.php not as important as you might think. This just covers the um, the instances of your module. Uh, throughout the course or throughout the site. Live.php, this is quite important. This is where Moodle figures out all the capabilities or all the, um, the things that your activity module does. For example, does it have backup and restore? Does um, Can you drag and drop something 
onto the onto the course contents area and expect your module to be able to know how to decipher that and create a an instance of your plugin. Um, grading does your does your module have gradebook integration? So all this kind of information that's all in live.php. Uh, local live, this is just this is for you to play with. So you can just kind of like you know create classes here or add helper functions here and just use as you will. In many cases, you're now encouraged to use you know, auto bet, what's it called? Um, namespaces and auto class loading by putting your classes into the classes folder. Um, but you'll still see local live.php used often. Module JS is, is all the JavaScript for your plugin. Render.php, we talked about this as before. This is where you put all the, uh, um, where you're going to output HTML to the page. You, know, you want to put out a select box, or you want to put out a table, or you want to put out some buttons. Um, you generally delegate that to functions within the renderer.php. The, the beauty of that is that it, it allows a theme developer to actually override functions from your renderer.php without, without actually modifying your plugin. So, for example, it may be that your plugin is not accessible enough for somebody in a blind school, and the developer in the blind school may override one of your renderer functions and add bits and pieces here so that your, your plugin is now accessible. Okay, And they could do that without worrying about your plugin um, overwriting their changes when you upgrade or when they upgrade or something like that. Settings.php. Uh, this is where the admin settings go. So the actual, the actual when they install the plugin or settings that apply to uh, acro across all instances of your plugin, they, they are put in settings.php. The version, very important. This is uh, the version of your plugin and some other information, notably the component name of your plugin. And view.php. This is the entry point uh, into your module. This is, so when, you, when a user clicks on your activity module on the course page, um, view PHP is opened and what they see is what view PHP delivers to them. Okay. Now I want to stop fluffing around shortly, but I'll just cover a few quick things and then we'll, let's go through and actually use the new module template and make a, uh, a new plugin. So this is version.php. This is quite important and we mentioned it here. Um, I'm going to skip through the actual page by page explanation of each of those files because I've already covered it. But if you want more information, the PowerPoint or the PDF for this presentation is available in the, uh, uh, the course area for this particular presentation. So you should download it from there. And there's more information about each of those files that I just talked about. But I don't want to waste too much time by just doing what you could probably just read. Uh, but I do want to cover this Franken style component name because it is important. So it should follow this particular pattern here, the plugin type, underscore, and the plugin name. So in the case of an activity module, the plugin type is a mod. In the case of a question type, the plugin type is a queue type. In the place of a filter, the plugin type is filter. Okay, and then underscore, and then the actual name of your module. It pays to have a quick look through the, uh, the plugins database and check that nobody else has actually used that particular name before, especially if it's a very generic name. You know, something like you know mod audio well that might have already been used before right so you don't want to kind of get in trouble later on because it's very hard to change your component name once you decided it okay now we'll just skip through most of these slides here and just go to very close to the end But you can see you do have all of these things to look at. So yeah, so I do want to talk about this. Okay, these are globals. You'll often see these in uh, Moodle code. These contain important information that uh, Moodle prepares for you, and then you, you can use when you need to. Uh, the most important of these are the three at the top: the dollar CFG, dollar DB, and dollar user globals. The CFG holds information about, for example, the URL of the website or the path to the data directory. These are some of the, uh, the members of the CFG Global. WW root, that's the, uh, I think it's actually the URL of the site. DR root, that's the path to the, uh, to, the, to the directory in which the Moodle site is on the server. LiveDR, that's the path to the live folder on the server. 
data root, the data directory, temp directory. Okay. Uh, DB, this is the way, this is the point at which you access the database API function. So you'll see that a lot. User, this gives you information about the logged in user, uh, the username. Uh, you can access the user picture. You can access other information from here. Uh, this is quite useful because, for example, if you want to um, present some information to the user about, for example, their grades, you would rather use the, the global user object here because that comes from the user's session uh, and Moodle knows who that user is. But if uh, you tried to use a user ID that was kind of passed around in the URL, uh, it's possible that somebody might sneakily put in somebody else's user ID and, and see their grades. So that's this is actually a security uh, benefit here to using this, this global user object. Okay. Right, on with the show then. Let's actually go through and um, use this new module template that I have prepared. So now I'm going to screen share, and I shouldn't lose anybody, but if I do, please let me know. I'll be looking at the chat on the other computer, which I'm going to get rid of now. I'll turn off my webcam just because I don't want to um, max out the bandwidth or do anything weird like that. You're probably sick of seeing me. Okay. Here we go, screen cam, uh, screen share. Takes a while to kind of spark up here. I think it does. So I'll press the button again, see if that makes a difference. I was able to successfully screen share the other day, so I don't see any reason why it wouldn't load up. Um, try again. Sorry to make you wait. It's, 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 I can hear noises. So I think it's working. There we go. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, we, we, I've, got, I've got it working. Yay. All right, so let's go. Um, so first of all, the, the new module template, I've actually downloaded that from my GitHub repository. The links are there on the presentation. And I'll show those to you shortly. So you can do everything I do here yourself if you want to. Um, and where are we now? Here is my GitHub repository here. So browser, so you can see that. Okay, and this is the the new the new temp the, the new module template here. This is the Atto template here. This is the one that we've downloaded here, the, the Moodle mod new module template here at github.com Justin Hunt. And I've already downloaded that. And it's here, and I've expanded it here just to save a bit of time. And we're going to make a new module and we're going to call it um to rename the folder so let's call this rugby because Moodle doesn't have a rugby module and all the kiwis in the audience a bit they want to have a rugby module on the kiwi so let's call it rugby we're going to make a rugby module and the uh as i mentioned earlier the way to do this is actually to go through and rename the template so to actually do this we have to rename uh, all the strings that occur which have at at new module, all the string, strings which occur which have mod underbar new module underbar, all the strings which occur which have at at new module at at, this is lowercase, and all the strings which have copyright notice. I put a little note of how many strings will be replaced here just as a little way of checking that it actually has worked for you. Um, let's do it really quickly. I use, 
I use Notepad++ to do this, but any programmer's text editor or IDE will be able to do this, go to go through and do a search and replace. Uh, so let's go here. Rugby, and I'm going to make this okay. I'm going to match the case. I'm going to do everything in that folder called rugby. I'm going to replace it not with new module but with rugby, the uppercase. So this would mean, let me just confirm what we're going to do here. We replace all instances of at hat, new module at hat, with the uppercase module name, e.g., widget. So in this case, it's going to be rugby. So let's go back to what we had. Okay, that looks good. Big fail, yeah, you know it, Andy. So here we go, replacing files. And it should be three. Should we just be three there? Let's check, okay, three. So that was good. Right, let's come back and have a look at what we have to do. So the next one is mod under, underscore new module underscore. And we're going to replace that with our Frankenstein component name with the underscore. Okay, so it's going to be mod rugby underscore. So let's go back. So mod new module underscore. And we're going to replace that with mod underscore rugby. Here we are. And Good. So let's come back uh, here. 141 is correct. Good. Then we've got at hat new module at hat, and it's going to be 330 replacements. So let's try that. At hat new module at hat. This is going to be rugby. Let's see if that's. Okay, 330. That's good. And finally, we just want to replace the copyright notice. So you don't want it to be written, your new plugin, your new rugby plugin or whatever it is to be written by me. So we'll replace copyright notice with uh, the date and name that you want to put in there. And that's going to be... I've realized we're really like running a long time here. Sorry about that. Um, Thirty-one, is that correct? Let's check here. Thirty-one. Okay, it's good. Um, but we're still not out of the woods yet. The next thing that we need to do here, we actually have to rename uh, all the files in these three folders here, because they actually have names which include new module. We need to rename those to match our new plugin name. So those are folders, uh, file files in the languages languages folder, lang folder, the backup folder, and in the classes task folder. So let's go back into that quickly. Backup. Little two. And here they are. Let's change these to rugby as well. It's a bit time consuming. This is kind of no-brainer work. So as we do this, I'll tell a gag, and you guys see if you can uh, type in the text here what the answer to my gag is. Uh, what do Winnie the Pooh and Attila the Hun have in common? I'll repeat that. What do Winnie the Pooh and Attila the Hun have in common? Answers. Oh, Meg, she's too good. The same middle name. That's right. That's good. I mean, you might be a Kiwi. Are you a Kiwi? Classes. Uh, English teacher. Ah, uh, the English teacher. There you go. Uh, I don't need to be okay. More grunt work. So, what's white and lives in your stomach? How about that? What's white and lives in your stomach? Does anybody know that one? Not the English teacher, no. Okay, the answer is the abdominal snowman. <laughs> the abdominal snowman. It's pretty good, eh?
what do you call a sophisticated Australian? <laughs> oh no, <laughs> we're Aussie bashing. Gasp, I didn't want to get this, didn't want to get into this space. Okay, so the, the next step here is to uh, upload our, our plugin. Our plugin into uh, uh, our mod folder in our Moodle site. So this is this is you know this is really uh, for most of you I think this is probably pretty obvious. We just upload the plugin uh, and install it, and we should be ready to go. So the good thing about our plugin is it does have all those features. It's got the uh, the admin settings. It's got the instant settings. It's got it's got a renderer. It's got schedule tasks and background tasks. It's got capabilities. It's got tabs. It's all out of the box. So we'll install it and have to have a quick look at those, and then I'll I think I'll just come back and we'll take any questions that there might be. I would have liked to have actually gone through and you know um, shown you some some actual coding tasks, actually gone through and you know, changed a few things and added some features. Um, perhaps I'll rework things so that next time we do that. Okay, so it's installed. Uh, sorry, it's uh, it's copied into the Moodle system, but we need to actually now install it. So let's go to our notifications page and just check. If it's there, it should be. Mm, bogans, we're talking about bogans, goodness me. Um, I grew up in Glen Innes in Auckland. How about that? So, okay, so we're going to install the rugby activity. Upgrade the Moodle database now. Oh, federal keys are still not the limit of federation. Um, yeah, I'm annoyed. I'm not quite sure what I'm annoyed about, but I'm yeah, I'm a, I'm a Kiwi and I'm annoyed. Yeah, um, but I'm not not quite sure. Just trying to follow the comments as I do this. What do you get if you pour boiling water down a rabbit hole? I'm trying to defuse the attention. What do you get if you pour boiling water down a rabbit hole? Hot cross bunnies. <laughs> okay, so here we have our admin settings. So this is this will be applied to all of our instances of our thing. So rugby, let's call this um, I don't know what should we call it here, global rugby, just for just for no good reason. Okay, that's our that's our admin setting. And uh, when we when we actually add an instance of this to our course, we'll have an instance setting as well. Editing on. Yes, Andy's got a hot cross bunny. Indeed. Okay, good. Um, so here we have uh, Moodle CST. Where is it? Rugby. We have rugby. There's our rugby plug in there. All ready to go. And we have um, an instance setting here. Okay, so. Rugby name, let's call this the, from Perth. You guys are what is what's Perth? It's the Western Force, right? Okay, Western Force. The Eastern Force. The Western Force. That's the name of the uh, Perth rugby team. Description F -f -f -f. Um, And here's our instance setting here. So Western Force. There we go. Uh, we have some other fields here for grading uh, and completion. It's also got com uh, conditional. Completion, completion and conditional access uh, hooks there so that we can actually complete this activity on a certain grade if we wish to. Okay, so that's just out of the box there with this particular template. Save and display. Okay, here we are. As an admin, we can see that we've got um, our admin instance showing up here, setting. We've got our instance setting showing up here. We've also got another tab here. Because we are an admin, we can see reports. And we've got a very basic report, which is just you know, instances of this particular plugin, which are here in the in the course. But we could actually, you know, obviously add you know, much more interesting reports here based on the data that comes into our plugin. Uh, if we go across here to site administration, server, you can see scheduled tasks. We've got a scheduled task for our plugin. 
where that'll be right the rugby task there it is okay um, doesn't do anything it just kind of runs every time it's supposed to but it doesn't actually do anything um, so yeah our plugin is doing everything that it should and if we have a look at our if we log in here it's a regular user and we go in to our plugin we can see oh, it's not there in a different course Why is it not showing up? Something odd's going on there. Don't worry about that. Okay, so um, we'll close out the actual screen sharing here. So I'll return to you guys. And now I want to close my screen sharing session. Okay, and we're back. And I can see why do chicken coops only have two doors? Because if they had four, they would be chicken sedans. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite good. <laughs> I'll put that in my, my little repository of jokes. Okay, so um, that's all about the new template. And this is a little, little bit more information about how to actually rename your uh, your template or your existing mod to match uh, the name of your new module, if you want to follow this. And now is a good time to ask me questions if you have any, because we're at the 46-minute mark. Are there any questions? I can wait all day. That's what teachers are trained to say. I can wait all day for you to ask questions. Um, if there's no questions, it's really okay. If there's anything else you'd like me to show you or um, to go through, we can do that too. Or if you just like to take all that information that you've gleaned today and put it into practice right away, that's okay too. Uh, and I think I, I did. I introduced the new activity module today because it's something I've been working on, um, and I think it's very useful. But you know, if you really are starting out from scratch, I think probably a block is a good place to start because um, blocks have very limited limited kind of functionality. So there's not like a, my phone's ringing. There's, not, there's not, not that much to go wrong. And also the Atto, Atto plugin is actually quite simple because it's just uh, with, with very little code, you'll actually get an icon on the HTML editor and you can actually start to, you know, like just uh, add some functionality to Atto. Atto is still very new, so there's lots of things that aren't actually there yet. So it's a good place to add things. Yeah, I think question types in particular are quite difficult, Meg. Um, and that's partly the lie of the land. I mean, the, the quiz is one of the most complicated places in Moodle. It's do, there's so much going on and it's so flexible that that kind of leads to complexity. So the, the question type is quite tough. Um, recently, I've been enjoying working with enrollment plugins. It sounds kind of daft, but enrollment plugins are actually quite, quite neat too. They're very simple in some ways. Um, and actually, I think that's a good area where there's actually things that need to be made that aren't actually there yet um, in Moodle. For example, something I you know would, will probably need pretty soon. I've kind of started on, but there's no kind of like the only paid enrollment plugin that I know of is, is basically the PayPal one. And there's no, so many more pay, payment options available now for Moodle for for um, just for collecting payments online that to be still stuck with PayPal, it's kind of um, Stuck, stuck in the old days, really. So, for example, Stripe or Gumroad or some of these new payment processing options. If somebody made an enrollment plugin for one of those, I think people would be very happy. If you want to conditionally load specific classes, where do you store them and what method do you use to include them without using absolute paths? Oh, uh, if you want to conditionally load them. I think I think you you would use the auto the the the, the new auto how do you call it, auto loading classes that I don't think they're actually loaded until you actually you, know, you specify that you want them so you would use like the uh, can I show you 
maybe I, I could share my screen and show you. But in the um, classes folder, you can add things like t classes for your events or for your tasks. And when you call those, you call those using um, the namespace of that particular class. And it will be loaded up at that point, but you don't actually have to include any files to your uh, to your PHP file or include any like require once or require to actually get that class loaded in. If you see what I'm saying? Am I am I, am I warbling or do you follow what I'm saying, Scott? Is there a Git for Dummies introduction? Yeah, I think so. That's right, Scott. It just it just so and, and, and after fact, it's a far better option to use like the, the auto. Is a word for it, auto loading classes. Um, that um, because because it's so more so much more efficient. Yeah, yeah. The only the only problem is you can only put one class per file. So that kind of like sometimes you know it means you have a lot of classes, a lot of a lot of classes. If you've got one, a lot of files. You've got one particular class. You know? So for example, some of my forms, I just have one kind of base form, and then I have like you know another five or six forms which just extend the base form, but they're only actually you know two or three lines long. But in using this, this automatic class loading system, I'd actually have to have four or five files, you know, one for each class to make that work. Mm. Um, Andy, is there a Git for Dummies? There is a, if there's, there's Git for Dummies all over the internet. Yeah, I, I should have one really for you. I don't, I don't, I think, I think you're probably best to Google that, but Git is really, yeah, it's really worth getting into, even as, a, as an admin person and not as a programmer for keeping your plugins up to date. Uh, it's really, really handy. Um, just about Git being the best for all things Moodle because Moodle HQ is on Git, so it's easiest to use in conjunction with your custom code. Yeah, that's actually true. So, for example, if you want to get your plugin into the Moodle plugins database, if you've got your code on GitHub, you know, it's just it's just a couple of clicks, you know, on the uh, on the plugins database form to actually get your code copied over in the correct format right into the plugins database, and it makes upgrading so much easier. And also, kind of admins from various universities will get on your case if your plugin is not in Git because they get all weird about that because they want to be able to update it in a timely fashion. Have I ever used? Uh, no, I never used that. Never, never, never did that, Scott. Oh, yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah. Yep. Um, works fine. Yep. Yeah, I did that. So that's I did that with one enrollment plugin recently. I put the, yeah, yeah, um, basically it works as you would expect. There's nothing kind of complicated about it. It just works. Yep. Um, yep. Good. Get this. That's good. Thanks for putting that information in there about Git. Yeah. So I have a Git cheat sheet. You know, Git is, you know, Git's a whole other world and you can, you can get really, really kind of complicated with it. Um, I just kind of, I am interested, but I haven't really got time to kind of, you know, become an expert in one, one other thing. So I just have a cheat sheet. And when I when I do something new, I kind of make notes on my cheat sheet so I don't have to kind of learn that thing again. And the, the basic tasks, you know, I just kind of have you know, very basic entries on my cheat sheet for that. And I just pull that out when I need it. And I script a lot of my, um, my, uh, my, my plugin installations and upgrades into one particular uh, shell script and I just kind of call upgrade all and that runs through and pulls Git on every single one of them and upgrades everything in the background. So it's really neat. Yeah. All right, well, we might stop it there then. Thank you very much, Justin, for that. Um, some good Thank you, Mick. Um, so, again, as usual, conversation keep going on in the forum, um, and this presentation will be up online to refer back to because I don't know about everybody else, but I like looking at a guide when I'm doing something that's new and, and um, difficult for the first time. So, thank you very much, Justin. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Meg, and thanks to everybody from the uh, iMoot team. It's been a great iMoot, and I know it's not over yet. Um, so, uh, uh, Hope to catch a few more things. And thanks to everybody for coming along and listening. Um, I really uh, enjoyed having the chance to kind of put all my thoughts into a, one place and, and tell people about it. Time for a bacon buddy. Yeah, man. Thanks. <laughs> and thanks, Frankie, for Taylor and Charlie. Uh, I, I always appreciate having Frankie's, Frankie's input. He's a, he's a good man. Okay. Thanks, everybody.